would not leave that lake until we caught a fish. We stayed there. It was raining. It was, it was lightning and thunder. Me and John and Chris went out in that boat. Christopher, I'm sorry. He likes to be called Christopher. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. It took me two years to stop calling her V2. So give me, give me a little while, Christopher. We're out in that boat. And the lightning is in front. The lightning's behind. And we're just keep moving. Because we want to catch a fish. Just crazy. I'm starting praying, Jesus, Lord, you know I got a minister. I got things to do, Lord. Don't take me today. Please do not take me today. Then we go further. Then we decide it's getting a little too crazy. We need to go back. And the lightning starts getting, the lightning went right over our heads. But it went this way instead of this way. Me and Chris, okay, everybody, out of the pool. We're done. I said, John, pull over. I'm getting out. <laughs> I walked all the way back to the camps on the, that side of the lake because I didn't. And then we're worried about poor John. He, he's like, I'm going to bring the boat back. He's being a trooper. All this to catch a fish. Now, we could go through that much work to catch this thing we call a fish. What did he say about us? That we were going to be fishers of men. So we need to take some look, us men, and then we're going to carry over to the women, even though the women were doing a good job. Uh, I'm so excited about the women when I saw the pictures that came in of all the bags that they made. And I was never so proud to be married to an apostolic woman. I was so excited to have all these women in the church, including my wife, who helped out. We're making the bags or being there. She wasn't there Saturday because we had some health issues in the house. A little bit of an emergency took place. But I'm just here to tell you that it's, it's, it was such a great weekend all the way around for what the ladies and the men. I am just so excited about what God is doing in this church and in this city. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot to come. Uh, we're going to do more. The next thing we're going to plan, and I just I want to encourage you. We say this for five years. We're having another... Um, we're going to try to find a campground for all the families that want to go. See, next year we might try to save up and do a camp meeting of our own, but right now it's too close. October is the next time we're looking. I've got to find out my football schedule because I'm coaching. And then we're going to come up with a date in October. And we need you to, we got, it gives you, you know, a couple of months to save up. Uh, don't miss all the fun, man. We're going to go to another lake and we're going to camp out and we're going to, you know, all camp together. We want to be to where this is a fellowship, not just spread all, o all over someplace. Uh, so please take the time to put some money aside. It's going to teach you how to learn to budget a little bit uh, and help this process of creating unity in this church. That's the whole goal of us going and doing these things. Who wants unity in this place? Who wants to be unified as a powerful group? The Bible says two is better than one. Well, guess what? Two, twenty, two hundred. You know, we come together and we'll have more power together than we do alone. I'm going to say that again. We got more power together than we do alone. Praise God. So moving on, we had a great time. A lot of fun. And we intend to have more fun in this church. Because we're a fun church. Things are happening. Look at the sign. Look at the doors that are getting ready to get put up. Look at the kitchen that's getting ready to be put in. Things are happening in this church. And, and we've got some things we've cleaned up a little bit. So we've made it so it's a little better environment for the church to not have to experience certain things in the church. Praise God. So now what I want to do is I want to help you a little bit. I want to help you, and I, the Lord gave me an idea to actually preach a sermon going over the titles of every sermon in the last year. And maybe not that many, but at least a lot of them. Let me tell you why. Because each sermon's title is an, a, an attempt by the pastor to change your mind and your behavior. To change something in you to make you closer to God, whether it be your service or your repentance or um, your ability to, to do whatever it is that the church needs. That's what it's all about. It's getting better. Raising the bar. Someone say raise the bar. Because you know we can stop right here and say hey we got 50 people in church. You know we've been pretty steady in attendance. We got all this new stuff. We can just cruise now. No that's not what it's about. Because there's too many of us in here who still need to have maturity in their spiritual walk. We've got about half the church that are making either where they need to be or making the progress. And the other half of the church are not where they need to be. Now as a pastor, I can sit back and say, hey, they're coming to church so it doesn't matter. Just let them keep coming to church. That's not my job. My job is to take people from A and take them to B. Not have to stay at A. 
But to make progress spiritually, can I get an amen? So this is another one of those sermons that's going to do the same. It's called Modern Day Martyr. The Modern Day Martyr. This is not mine. This is a, a title that I was given through the preaching of brother, young brother Akers, who was just awesome. Uh, but it's got a John Michael twist to it because when I put something together, it comes from the mindset of what I know my church needs. So uh, please buckle your seat belts. And let's move on to a place of receiving what the word has to give. Let's stand as we pray. Right now before we go another step, I believe the Lord is calling for us to pray. Jesus, right now I ask you, in your wonderful, mighty, powerful name, we ask you, Lord, that the church receive, not just hear, but receive, not just be a hearer, but a doer of the things that are going to be put across the pulpit today. Let us be strengthened and matured spiritually by what we are hearing and doing. In Jesus' name and the church said amen. I wonder if you just clap wonderfully onto the Lord. I mean, just, just a wonderful clap and maybe even a shout, uh, whatever expression it is that you have for the Lord today. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Um, I was going to tell you something else, but I forgot what it was. I'm sure it'll come to me. If we open our Bibles to Acts chapter 14 and 19, if you're standing, you're just doing so in honor of the word of the Lord. We've already preached, I mean, we've already prayed, but uh, I want to, I felt like the Lord just wanted us to do something a little differently this time. But we're entering into the Word of God, Acts chapter 14, verse 19. The other thing I was going to tell you, I told you it'd come back to me. The other thing I want to share with you is that next week, we are going, God willing, we're going to be talking about the oneness of God. And we're going to be preaching about uh, the nature of God. Uh, I'm sorry, not the oneness of God. Jesus' name teaching about His name. Does anybody know what's important about the name? Anybody know why it's important? Hmm? Go ahead, brother. Because it's the only name. It's the only name. Jesus' name is powerful. It says, do all deeds in his name. It says, there's no other name under heaven by which men shall be saved. That name is superior to any other name to describe the, the Lord God we serve. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, it, it's something that Brother Akers talked about a little bit. Uh, he, he actually preached the whole message. I'm going to be not preaching that message but my version of uh, the scriptures and the concepts about that name and its importance praise the Lord so we're gonna go on a book of Acts chapter 14 verse 19 today's title is the modern day martyr and that's what we need to become is the modern day martyr verse 19 says this and there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Drew him out of the city, supposing that he had been dead. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Modern day martyr. Who is probably the most famous martyr that there is? <laughs> I said Stephen. The most popular or most understood concept of a martyr that we know is probably Jesus Christ. I mean, it, it, there should be under the definition of martyr, there should be a picture of Jesus or his name. Probably the most famous, the most significant. Pro no, why am I saying probably? Let me change that. He is the most significant. He is the most understood. He is the most important martyr who ever took place, who ever stepped up for the truth. But what we need is some modern day martyrs. We need more martyrs than just Jesus. Jesus said, greater things will ye do than I. And he was a martyr, so we need to be bigger martyrs. He, he healed people. We need to heal more people. He uh, created life and the idea of, of, of bringing people to his knowledge of who he was. We need to create more knowledge of life in people about who he is. And so 
We have Paul, who's probably uh, one of the, the most significant martyrs other than Jesus in the scripture. Why is Paul so important? Why is he such a big deal? He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He was used probably more than, why well, I keep saying probably? He was used more than any other man in the New Testament. He was a significant writer in the New Testament. And so when it comes to the presentation of Jesus, and he brought the Gospels to the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? Anybody who's not a Jew. And so this is a big deal. So we're going to talk, you know, Jesus we understand. We know what he did. We know why he did it. But I want to get to Paul because Paul is the extension of Jesus. And we need to be the extension of Jesus. We need to be the ambassador to Jesus. We need to be the presenter of Jesus. We need to be the light of Jesus. People need to see Jesus when they see us. And so I want to introduce Paul as a very important martyr in the word of God. In this scripture, he had just been stoned. Now, I want to just encourage you, because some of you feel stoned in your life. Not talking about high, but I'm talking about the things that are happening to you. You feel stoned where you're, you're receiving that persecution. You feel that, that suffering and that pain. So let's talk about Paul for a second. He was stoned, dragged out of the city, and he had been beaten so badly that they assumed he was dead. Because you don't just take one rock, hit him in the head and go, mm -hmm, I think he's dead. They pelted this man to the point where they do anybody else with the intention of killing him. So he wasn't just, you know, knocked out and laying there playing dead. This man had been beaten enough to die. And so they knew that because they're the ones that beat him, so they left him there thinking he was dead. Let's talk about what, Pete, what Paul does after this. Verse 20 says, How be it as the disciples stood around him. Let's stop there. Now understand, sometimes the scripture skips. Because they left him there for dead. They went away. Then the disciples come on the scene and find Paul. He is, he's in rough shape. He is nearly dead. Okay? Let's go on to 21. I'm sorry, continue in verse 20. He rose up. Who's that? Paul. He rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. Or Derby. Derby. Is that Derby? Derby. That's good enough. But wait a minute. This dude was just almost dead. Some of us, we get the sniffles. We can't come to church. We get a hangnail and I can't do nothing for God. This man had been stoned to the point of near death. The next day, he's on his way into a city. What does he do? It says that he went in with, to Derby, Verse 21, and when they had preached, wait, stop, stop, stop. The man was just almost dead yesterday. Gets up, rise. Look, some of I could just change the title now. We need to rise up, church. Doesn't matter what's going on in our lives. It doesn't matter what we're going through. We need to rise up through our situation. We may feel stoned. We may feel beat down through the rocks that are coming at us, the spiritual rocks that are attacking us. Oh, I'm a son of us. We need to rise up and go into Derby. We need to get up and preach. I'm not going to brag on me, but I remember there was a day we came back from uh, Carlsbad. And on our way out of Carlsbad, I was feeling fine. We hit Mickey D's, and I was feeling a little rough. Got me one of them ice creams. That thing fell right off of me. I was so mad. I took it went like this, and the whole thing bloop, fell on me. From, it was downhill from there. I started feeling heat. I started feeling sick. I started feeling a temperature. I feel a little nauseous, but mostly just fever. That was a Saturday. I wasn't sure if I was going to make it to church the next day. I was feeling, but you know what? I said, God, I'm going to church. If I'm, if I'm feeling good enough to stand up, I'm going. I wasn't contagious. 
You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm going to, I sat over there. I looked busted. I felt busted. But I was raising my hands to the Lord. Having a good time in church. I felt, but I'm going to be sick wherever I'm at. We need to rise up, church. We need to rise up and go into Derby. We need to go into our Derby. And we need to preach. Now, verse 21, and they preached the gospel to that city and taught many. Now, if you're not teaching one, and as a church, thank God the church is teaching many. We got Brother Eric, we got Brother Peter, Sister Tiffany is always learning, my wife's always learning, we got Sister uh, Susie, Sister T, um, we got a bunch of people, our Bible study on Tuesday is picking up, we had like 15 people in Bible study, the Bible studies are picking up, we're teaching many, but guess what, that's my work. You can't, listen, I'm just going to tell you straight up. You can't ride on my work. You got to do your own work. And right now, all your work is reaching the lost. Go out and tell people, hey, there is a place where you can go where you can feel some hope. There is a place you can go where you can feel the Spirit of God. And there's a place you can go where we will actually teach you to say, listen, you need to stop your sin. We're not going to rationalize and justify why sin's all over your life. We're just going to tell you you need to cut it out because that's what's causing a lot of your problems. So we have a place that has, a, I almost feel like a sense of purity here. Because what we're saying is, we don't want to rationalize and justify why the, so many people are busted. We want to break it up and fix it. That, that don't make no sense, break it up and fix it. Sometimes you've got to break something up to put it back together. The Lord does it all the time. So we need to teach many. I'm doing my job. The board's doing its job. The leaders are doing their job. Now it's time for the church. See, it's always comes back. Past you and do it again. Yes, I'm going to do it again. If we're going to go forward, we got to reach out. If we're going to go forward, we got to reach out. We got to start looking at the loss. We've got to start putting ourselves in a position of saying, I am hungry enough. And that's, we're going to work how that being a modern and martyr is going to help that, that situation. We're going to get there, but I've got to move on. So now they're teaching many. They return. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. They return to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. Isn't that where the man just got beat up? Isn't that where the man just got dragged out and stoned? And now he's going back? I got so many things I can preach from that. I don't know where to start. Listen, sometimes we get busted up in things that we're doing. We got to get back in the game. You can't, you can't be held hostage to your history. I'm going to say that again. You can't be held hostage to your history. I'm going to tell you something. Right now, I bought a house that's right around the corner from the street I used to smoke crack. I used to have to always take a turn where I, my house is, where I turn every day to go home. I, I, have, I have to make that turn. One time I was so anxious to go get my drug. It was snowy and I hit that turn too fast. And, uh, and I hit that curb. My tire was wobbly every after, after that. Because I was in such a hurry to go get my drugs. I remember that turn. I, now I have to make that turn every day to go home. Now every day to go to work. I actually got to, I'm going to have to pass the street where I used to buy drugs every day to go to work. I'm not held bondage by my history. That don't mean nothing to me anymore because guess what? I am a new creature and a new creation. And so those things don't even bother me. Now I don't see it as where I used to get high. I see it as where I live. That's where I live now. That's where I work. We're so afraid to go. We need to go back to some of our families. Oh, come on. I'm a, I don't know how long I'm going to spend on this one. See, there's some, some people who have hurt us. There's some people who have done us wrong. And, and we won't go back and deal with those situations. The Bible says in Matthew 18, it says that when you have a conflict with someone, the first thing you're supposed to do is go to that person. Do you know how difficult it is to get people to do that? Just to go to that person and say, listen, I have a problem with what happened. That's Bible. But we can't do it. Some people have a conflict in the church. Oh, I can't go back to that. How many times have you heard that? Oh, I can't go back to that church. Now, fortunately, we don't hear about this church too much because there's not a whole bunch of reasons why people would have to say that here. Because fortunately, when people walk out that door, 
We allow them to. We don't try to control them. We try to beat them up. We just say, hey, we love you. Well, if you come back, we'll be sitting here with arms wide open. But you know, when you leave some churches, don't you talk to them no more. They're in rebellion. And that rebellion is going to spread all. Please, you see that person, you give them a hug. And say, we miss you so much. Oh, we just miss you so much. We just love, we miss your kids. We, you need to come see us. That's why a lot of people come back to this church all the time. All the, because they're never treated poorly when they leave. But most importantly, we can't be afraid to go back to the areas that we were beat up to go do something for God. Because see, I can go into the areas where I used to go. I used to go into the crack. Now, I'm not suggesting you do this. I was uh, on fire and full of the Holy Ghost. I go back to the crack house where I used to get high and say, listen, you don't have to do this anymore. Do you want to come to church? I will teach you a Bible study. And, and they're wearing, you know, the best time to go was on Monday. Because see, I'm, I'm an ex-drug addict. I know this. Monday is when you're broke and alone and hurting. You ain't got uh, money to buy a pack of cigarettes. You've been smoking dope all weekend. And, and you're sitting there thinking about what you didn't pay. The bills you didn't pay. The place you lied to. We said you were supposed to be X, Y, Z. And you still ain't there. And all, it's all sitting there on Monday. Monday is the best time to go to a crack house. But better if you're not an ex-crack addict. I don't, I don't really do that anymore because I was doing that as a fervor and I don't, I got, I got other things to do. But when I used to do that, I was talking to this one lady. I'm sitting there and it's Monday and I'm like, listen, you don't have to be here. She's wearing sunglasses because, you know, she don't, you don't, you don't want to see your face. Sometimes when you, when you can't see your eyes, you feel like your whole face is covered. I began to speak to her and tears start to come down behind the glasses. We need to go back to some of these places that we came from. Even today, she had no idea I was going to preach this. She had no idea. No idea I was going to preach this. But the idea of going back to where she came from. Just like Paul goes back to the place he was beaten up. There's a lot of memories. Sister, I can imagine the memories you have of the places and things that happened to you. And things that you did. But those things are gone. She went back with power. To say, listen, there is another way to live, and we can help you. And we're, now I'm in a church. I've been where you're at. And you can't tell me I don't know. I know, and I can help you, and I'm willing to help you. Our church is willing to help you. <laughs> Woo, we got to go back to some of these places. Paul, it doesn't say whether he was scared or not. It don't matter. He went back. He went back to the same place he was beaten up. Just like with Peter. Peter, when he preached... On the day of Pentecost, uh, I've said it a million times, but see who remembers. I'm going to see if these people listen. That's what I want to know. Peter, a million times. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, that's the wrong word. Peter should have been a million times more afraid than he was on the day of Pentecost. What's the significance of him preaching to the Jews the way he did? Because he did the same thing. He went back. What did he see? Why is that so important that Jesus, that, that, that Peter could preach Jesus to the Jews? Why should he have been afraid? He denied Jesus three times and all he did was saw Jesus get arrested. That's all he saw and he was so scared that he would not admit that he even knew Jesus. He even started cursing so he didn't seem like a Christian. But he went back to those same Jews when he was full. That's the difference. When he was full of the Holy Ghost and said, guess what? That same guy you put on the cross that you killed, that same Jesus is both Lord and Christ. Amen. He should have been horrified. Why? Because he had seen Jesus beaten so badly that you can't even recognize him. He denied him three times just when he got arrested. When he saw him so badly beaten, and so badly torn up he should have been horrified it's amazing what you can do when you're full of the Holy Ghost it's amazing the power that you can acquire when you're full of the Holy Ghost it's amazing you can go back to the place that you've been beaten up when you're full of the Holy Ghost it's amazing what God can accomplish in the church when you are full so he goes verse 21 he goes back to the same place that beat him up and threw him out verse 22 confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through great what, what through much what and that we through much what much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God where do people get the idea 
that when you come to God, everything is going to be roses. And that you're going to come into heaven with no problems and no pain. And oh, once you get saved, it's going to be all good. It says through much. Anybody going through? Let's, let me just ask. Let's see. It's July. Has anybody gone through any tribulation this summer? Last couple of months? Don't be fretting. Don't, sh don't, don't worry. Because it says through much tribulation. It's the way we're going to enter into the kingdom of God. We have got to go through it. We've got to do it. And we better learn how to endure it if we are intending on going. See, many of us get deterred from trip. Oh, come on. I'm about to preach. I'm about to preach. Do not let this tribulation become a deterrent to your behavior. Because it is that exact tribulation that's going to fuel your fire. That's the same thing I've been preaching about. Do not deny your fire. Do not d d embrace your tribulation. Embrace your situation. Because God's using that situation to mold you. To create in you that person he needs to be one of his soldiers. How can you be a soldier without any training? How can you go? Listen, do you know what they do with the Navy SEALs? Do you know what they do to those men? We're talking about some of the toughest men on the planet. And at least... The majority of them quit before the week is over. That, that one week they call it crazy week. You know, I ain't going to say the word, but it's bad. It's a tough week. The, major, the, the baddest military people from the, in, in, in the whole military go to this training. And only a handful make it. So listen, if you're going through some tribulation, the Lord is trying to create in you a soldier that he can use that is going to make you so tough and so strong that you can take on any battle that's coming down the pike. That's the kind of warrior I want to fight with. I don't want to fight with somebody who has no wounds or no, no, no scars. That means they haven't been fighting. I want to be with those people who can go into battle saying, okay, here we go. Let's do this. We've done this before. The experienced warriors don't go, oh, if we're going to get a battle. Oh, are we going to be okay? No, you're not going to be okay. So be quiet. Let's go fight. I love that, you know, the, you ever watch these big soldier movies and they got these big, tough, bad soldiers, you know, scars across their chest, scar across their head, and they're, okay, we're going to battle. And they're excited about it. And they have been wounded and injured before, but they have no fear of going to battle. I would like to have a church full of people who have so many scars. They're not afraid to go to battle. They're just going to be a warrior with courage and ready to go to battle anytime God calls on. Oh, but we'll shut up. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a, I ain't going to lie to you. I feel like I got a couple big scars on me. That I'm just like, you know, we, we get some new recruits and we say, hey, man, we're going to go to battle. And they're like, are we sure? Yeah, let's go, dude, man. Let's do this. You see this one? You see that scar right here? There was one. I mean, see lethal weapon. I don't. Hate the, I don't like always use movies. But the third one, he meets this woman. You know, he's he's got bad luck with women. His first one gets murdered. His second one gets murdered by his enemies. The third one, she's a cop. And when they meet each other, they start ex exchanging war stories about scars. Oh yeah, that's nothing. Look at this one. This is a twelve gauge. Or, no, this was a six inch knife. Look at. And they were both tough. Men and women, hear me close, men and women can be warriors for God. And that's what we're looking for. God's trying to create an army in this city to take on the things that need to be done to get people to the kingdom of heaven. That is the goal. That is the key. That is the battle. And it takes some fighting. Mm, we were talking to Christopher the other day. We were letting him know, you know. There were some things we were talking about. Some of us were sharing some of our struggles. And he goes, wow, man, we're still sure talking about this person a lot. And I'm like, let me tell you something, man. I was telling him in the car, as a pastor, now hear me close. This was really cool that I, was, I could share this with Christopher. As a pastor, I don't just take on my family's burdens. But I take on your burdens and your burdens. When you guys go through it, I go through it with you. And, I go, and I'm there with you and I'm fighting with you. And so when someone comes against the pastor, that hurts. Because anybody in this church that comes against me, there's without a, without a doubt, someone who I have put tons of blood, sweat, and tears into and poured out my love. Because I do that with every person in the church. But sometimes sin besets people and it does so in a kind of evil way. And it doesn't happen very often, praise God. But it happens. And when it happens, they come against the path. That that's a burden. 
And that's my burden to carry. I'm all right. Don't, don't feel sorry for me. But understand that there's, that's why it's so important for us to have unity. Because the fact is, I need you. I need all of you. I need all the people you're going to win. Because see, I'm in a battle. And I, I don't want to fight by myself. My wife and I started this thing from the ground up. We had to do a lot of fighting on our own. But guess what? We shouldn't have to do that anymore. Because we're creating generals and lieutenants and captains. And now we're creating an army. So I don't have to go through the same stuff. Because I've got more, uh, uh, more, more personnel. More artillery. I got the scars. But you know, once you start creating scars, you don't should have to fight as much. I earned my scars. You go get yours. Praise the Lord. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. That's what I do every single week. Is exhort you to continue in the faith. Because every time you walk out of this building, the enemy tries to give you reasons why you should not continue in the faith. Every experience is negative. All the tribulation is an attempt to get you to not continue in the faith. And so that's what my job is, is to try to get each and every one of you to say, you know what, no matter what happens, I'm going to continue in the faith. Praise God. Let's talk about what a martyr is. One, two, three, four. Oh Lord, we're going to be here for a while. <laughs> Let's see what we got. Oh, it's early. We're doing good. What is a martyr? A martyr is a person who willingly suffers death rather than renounce his or her religion. That's why Jesus is the, the biggest martyr because he went to death. He would not tell the Jews, I'm not God. Because that would be a lie. He was God. He was not going to go against what his father in heaven, which was inside of him, told him to do. He said, go and do this. Even though he asked, can, can this cup pass by me? Because I know what I'm getting ready to go through. Not just the, the suffering, but the receiving of the sin of the world. And not just of the world at that time, but from beginning and the end of time. I'm sorry, I'm talking fast, but that's just, that's fun. That's big stuff. He didn't want to take that on. He was asking for the cup to be passed, and God said no. Oh man, can I preach? Look, there are times that you're going to ask God to do stuff, and he might tell you no. My grace is sufficient, sufficient for you. There's so many of this, this name it, claim it society, no matter what you ask for, God's going to do. You're taking that out of context. It's in the will of God. Ask in his will, not in your own will. Because when you ask in your own will, God can say no. That's how God operates. But a person who willingly suffers, that's a martyr.